Estağfurullah. Alhamdulillah, sizler de selamun ve resulüden. Eleven sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Fortin forty five. Mahkum Hicra. Wednesday, 20th of October 2023. We're continuing today part three of the Fiqh of Marriage. Those of you are following us in the book, the concise presentation of the Fiqh. We are on page 373. Uh, firstly, uh, can I just apologize to the sisters uh, for last week? Uh, we will remember, inshallah, to read out the questions. And there's a question that we didn't do last week. So I apologize to the sisters, inshallah. We will, yeah. we will follow that process this time, inshallah. The right. heading yeah, good. The obligation of getting the woman's approval before the marriage. Bismillah, <clears throat> alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Uh, we are now in the third session of marriage. And we have talked about the engagement and asking for the approval. And we're going to be talking now to that it is compulsory upon us to make sure that the woman who is to be married has her consent. That is important. This is important as well to make sure that you understand that we don't have something called forced marriage. Yes, we do have arranged marriage. The difference between the two is obvious. Arranged marriages is mean that a marriage which uh, fulfills all the conditions and the pillars that we talked about, and the person comes from the door, not jumps from the window, that's called arranged. So it's not just simply a man and a woman, they go together without the consent of the wali that we talked about, uh, without the arrangement of the whole family to be involved, just to make sure that the people who say arranged marriages, they're not really implementing or implicate uh, a forced marriage. No, arranged marriage, that means a marriage, which is, that is, as I said, fulfilling all these conditions that we talked about, and it is to be arranged, not to be, as I said, um, kidnapping a person, basically. Um, forced message, marriages is not allowed in Islam. So we'll go ahead, please. Although there's no marriage without a wali, it is obligatory upon the wali to obtain the woman's approval before the marriage. Right. So we said that there is no marriage without the wali, but yet, even though the wali has to obtain the approval of that daughter or the sister, whatever he is, inshallah, going to be the wali for. Now, it's not allowed for him to compel uh, the woman to marry if she is not pleased with it. If he concludes a marriage contract that she is not pleased with, she has the right to annul the contract. She has to the right to annul the contract. That means to basically dissolve it. She has the right to dissolve it if she if that marriage with that was without her consent. Abu Huraira, in the race of the Prophet says. The non-virgin is not to be married until she requests it, and the virgin is not to be married without her consent. What's the difference here? Not to be questioned and the consent. What does that mean? Both is consent, isn't it? But you see, that is to be questioned. That means the one who has been married before, so she has the courage to say yes or no. I want to marry him. I don't want to marry him. Whereas usually it is the case that the virgin the ones who are not married before, they will be shy. So the consent could be not by, you know, an open yes or explicit yes. She could be shy. She could tell her mother, she will not tell her father, the wali. So the consent is here is approved. Whereas the other one, she will say to you yes or no. That's the difference between it. It has step to step more and to step them. They said, Messenger of Allah. They said... How is her consent? To the consent of the, one, of the one who is a virgin. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if she remains silent. She remains silent, that's consent. Because usually if he doesn't like it, she would say, I don't like it. <laughs> but if she's consent, she'll be quiet. That means that I'm okay with it. Now. Hansa bin Khidam al-Ansariya. So Hansa bin Khidam al-Khidam al-Ansariya, she said, that her father had married her while she was a non-virgin, and she disapproved of the marriage. She went to the Prophet وسلم, and he annulled her marriage. Okay, so she's married when she was Thayyib. Thayyib means non-virgin here. It means that she was married before. Okay, she was married before. 
So she didn't go ahead with this marriage. It wasn't her consent there. So that she went to the Prophet. Prophet of Allah, he had annulled, that means he had cancelled her marriage. Ibn Abbas, and those were now talking about the virgin. Who narrated that a virgin young lady came to the Prophet and mentioned to him that her father had married her off while she disliked her. The Prophet then gave her the option to another marriage or remain in the marriage. Right. Before now, we go ahead to the following title, which is the Khutbat in Nikah, the speech that you put forward before you go ahead to make the Nikah. There are things I need to make sure that we have uh, discussed them. Number one, is that if the person had accepted and approved to marry a woman and there was a promise between the two, usually is the case there would be some gifts to be exchanged. That's before the marriage. So let's say that the gifts had taken place and then later on that the marriage did not go ahead for any reason, whether it's the reason from the side of the groom or from the side of the right. Remember, they're not married yet. Okay. So they have to, they want to cancel this marriage, not to go to go ahead with it. We say it is not correct for you to go and take the gifts back, whether the sister's uh, family had given gift to the groom, or usually it's the groom and the groom family would gift the bride to be. So they're not supposed to take the gift back because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al Aidu fi hibati. The person who gets his gift back is like the dog who licks back his vomit. And that's really disgusting. You know, don't lick you back. Your, and no one is allowed to. That means it's haram to take the gift back from any person except the, the father to the son. So the father gives the son the gift, he's allowed. Yes, he's allowed to take it back. They take, they, take it, <laughs> they take it back for a reason that is not to distinguish between him and another son or another daughter. Not, no, no. It's because of a reason. Because I've given you this mobile. It's a gift, but you're not you're missing about with it. You're not using it the right way. Give it me. Give it to me. No problem. Um, the other issue as well I need to add here is that if a person uh, said to another person, that I want to engage such and such girl. And he himself wanted to engage her and wanted to ask for her hand. Then if he knew that the family of that girl that would have more acceptance to that person who told him that he wants to get engaged with that woman, then he should not go ahead and ask for her hand first. Do you understand me? Let's say me and somebody else, or let's say Zubair, and somebody else want to go and get married, uh, a woman, a particular woman. They don't know about each other. So this person who's a brother of his, a friend of his, he came to him and said, Zubair, you know, I want to get married to such and such girls, which he had already in his mind want to as well get married to her. If that person who's been told by this person he wants to engage to that and ask for that woman's hand, that the family of that woman they would have more likely, more likely to accept this person, not him, then he should be waiting for what the result of this engagement. Do you understand that? He should be waiting because he knows. This is what happened with Abu Bakr and the Prophet. And the Prophet of Allah, Abu Bakr, here, Umar al Khattab, and his daughter, Hafsa, she had no, no husband. Her husband died. So he looked for a husband. So he went to Abu Bakr first. And Abu Bakr did not give him an answer because he knew already that the Prophet of Allah had mentioned Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, after she got, you know, her husband died. He mentioned it in a way that he wants her because he knew that Umar Khattab, if he knew about the Prophet of Sallam's offer, he would accept the Prophet of Allah to be the husband of his daughter. That's why he was waiting and he did not give him an answer. As for Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he came to him, he said to him, I want to give you my hand of my daughter. He said, okay, give me two days. And after two days, he said to him, I don't want her. He said to him, I was not as mad as on Earth, mad as the message was what? on Abu Bakr. He did not give me the answer. But later on, when the Prophet of Allah asked for her hand, Abu Bakr disclosed to him why he said to him no or yes. He had held him. He said, Wallahi, I've heard the Prophet of Allah mentioning your daughter, and I, and I knew that you could accept her, you know, to be 
accept him to be her the husband of your daughter, and that's why I was not uh, I was I was not going ahead to accept your daughter. Otherwise, if the Prophet didn't accept her, I would have said straight away, I will accept her as a wife of mine. Okay, right. This is the second issue. The third issue which is very important. That this person he wants now to make a marriage on a woman, and he has the intention of divorcing her. So he wants to marry her, but he's got in his mind the intention to divorce her. As soon, let's say, for example, he comes here as a student from such and such country, and this person, he is in his mind, as soon as he finishes his studies, he wants to act to divorce her. Okay? I don't think this person would accept such a thing to take place onto his sister, does he? No way. Nobody would accept such a thing. But it happens, and there's a fatwa. This fatwa is wrong, even though it's from a very well-known, respected scholar, may Allah have mercy upon him, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Allah, which other scholars had refuted his fatwa, and that is as talaq, that is to marry with the intention of divorcing. Nobody would accept it on any person. Nobody. But there is an exception of an exception. I would say there is an, another accepted, accepted marriage like this. That this person, he is a student, and he's fearing upon himself haram, so he wants to get married, but not with the intention of divorce. But if he he marries her, then if he's going to go back to home country, now he will decide whether this lady, she's fit for him or not. So if she's fit for him, he will carry on with be her husband, and she will be his wife, and go ahead. But already to have the intention to divorce her, regardless whether she's good or not, that's not correct. And that is not right. And also to set a time, I'm going to marry you only for three years and so, you know, as long as I finish my study. That's called nikahul muta. And nikahul muta is nikah batil, it's void. This is the rafi that they do it. It's been cancelled, I've been abrogated. Okay? So that's not Allah. So again, and nikahu biniyat al talaq is not correct. And nikahu. Be to the make nikah with the intention of divorce is not right. Also, to get married with the intention of for a particular time to say to them, setting a time that's called nikah al muta, which is also haram. And I'm saying this to make sure that the people who have an offer from outside, especially from the country where Sheikh Ibn Baz is, that to make sure and uh, make sure that this person is not marrying that daughter of yours or the sister of yours for a particular time and as soon as he finishes from her he will say to her bye bye that's important so you have to understand that this is marriage is to last because this marriage is to settle this marriage is to bring calmness not to bring that the person is not is on his feet he doesn't know he's going to go ahead with this marriage or not so this is mithaq ghalil Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as to be what? very strong bond between the husband and the wife, strong bond. And also he called it second, litaskunu ilayha. So you could calm. What type of marriage is it that you're going to be marrying a woman whom if she knew about your intention, she will never marry you? Imagine that he would say to you, oh, well, I'm marrying you just for the sake of my studies. As soon as I finish my study, I'm going to divorce you. Which wife are you going to accept that? That's called khiana, betrayal. Right. Now we're coming to I, I would call this person is a is a is a rashash, cunning person. Now we're coming to a khutbat in nikah. Uh, any person who's sending messages, Akhwani, I don't read messages, but I don't have the time to read the messages. So it has to be after the questions, has to be after we finish the talk, inshallah. If you want to ask, you could ask. The khutbah of the wedding ceremony. It is recommended that there be a speech when the contract is made. This speech is known as Khutbah al Khayyat, and its wording is the following. Right. This Khutbah that we, you've heard it must be from the Imam number of times here. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu, which is the Khutbah of Al Hajjah, that you start your Khutbah, which is the Khutbah that is the speech of the Jumu'ah, or the Khutbah, which is to engage somebody. To get married to somebody. And this uh, khutbat in nikah basically is to be said by the person who's making the nikah, or it could be said by the person who wants to get married, no problem. So let's say that the person who wants to make the nikah, let's see that the imam is making the nikah, 
and the person who wants to say it is the groom to be, which is the husband to be, that's no problem. This is the this is the asset. This is how it's supposed to be. Okay, so the, the person who is making conducting the nikah is just making sure that the nikah will go smoothly and fulfilling the conditions. So here, this person he will say, whether as I said, the one who is making the nikah, the imam, or the person who is the husband to be, he would say, "Inna alhamdulillah, Then after the person who is the wali will go ahead and accept, and he would say, "I offer you my, the hand of my daughter." So. And then he would accept, yes, I accept to marry her. And that's the marriage. So the person who is conducting the marriage is to make sure that they're filling up the papers and the signatures and the wali is to be present, the two witnesses to be present, and they are two just witnesses. That's what it is. It's formalities to make sure. We call it masalih mursala. We call it masalih mursala. You see, when we make a transactions or when we get somebody alone, give somebody a loan, we write it down. And Allah Azza wa made it very, very recommended, mustahab jiddan, that is to write any transactions which is to do with the money and the property. Now, the contracts between husband and wife is more important than the money contract. So if we said it's very recommended to attach things on, you know, uh, on paper regarding a husband, a, 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 like a money uh, swapping here, then it will be more of a priority to make sure that the marriage is to also to be documented. So every person knows his fuquq, his wajibat, his, that is his obligation and his, his duties. Um, as for the person who is, uh, uh, cannot talk, you call him the dumb person, cannot talk, if he can give a sign of his consent of marrying, there's no inshallah it will be accepted. Whether it's a, a sister or a man who is dumb, then if he's given a sign, a gesture that he's accepting, that is to be accepted as for his marriage. If any person had asked for consultation from you regarding marrying such and such person, then you must tell him what you know that it will make him to go ahead or not to go ahead. Not everything. So let's say this person who you've been asked about, he is, mashallah, really good. But maybe have a slight negative point. So I don't need to tell him about the negative point. Because that negative is little is minor. I would say, if I had a daughter, I will marry him to my daughter. That's enough. If I had a daughter, I will accept him to be a candidate for my daughter. So that means if you accept him to be a candidate for your daughter, then you're going to accept him as well to be a candidate for that person who would ask you about that person. Is that okay? So you don't have to go ahead to disclose those little things which is not going to affect. Same thing here. If you knew about him to be bad, you have many things about him as bad. If one bad thing is to be mentioned, we will put that person off, then it's enough. So I know that, for example, he is a person, he is not truthful. And I know he is a thief. And I know he is a fornicator. Three things. This person came and asked me about him. Brother, he's not truthful. That person said, well, maybe I'm still going to go ahead. Brother, he's a thief. Um, maybe, well, stop stealing. Brother, he's a fornicator. So I had to give him what I do. So if he's not determined, if he said, I want to get married, suit yourself, it's up to you. I'm giving you what I believe, but I don't have to tell him from the beginning all of these three things. I will tell him what is enough for him to make a decision. If I thought that the decision was not good, I will give him the extra bit. Because remember, you want to not to disclose things about the person. He might repent to Allah. Subhanahu wa By this, we'll stop, inshallah, and we'll continue after the prayer. Jazakumullahu khair. Status. <laughs> Those of you who are joining us, we're continuing the chapter on the fiqh of marriage. We've just discussed uh, before the uh, jama'ah the khutbah, khutbah al haja, and uh, the sheikh recited part of the Arabic and the English meaning. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think everybody knows it. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiru which is all praises you to Allah. We praise him, seek his aid and ask his forgiveness. He's correct in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evils of our actions. Um, sabar Allah guide. None can misguide and um, sabar Allah misguides. None can guide. I have a witness that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah alone. I mean no partner. 
And I bear witness that Muhammad is a slave in his messenger and the verses, O you who believe fear Allah, so should be feared, that are not accept in the state of Islam. O you who believe fear Allah, uh, the, the one who you lord, the one who created you from a single person, from him he created his wife, and from them both he created many men and women. And fear Allah through whom he demand your mutual rights and do not cut relations with your relatives. Surely Allah is ever and all watch over you. O you who believe fear Allah, as he... Uh, oh, you who believe, fear Allah and uh, speak all with the truth. He will direct you to do righteous good deeds and will forgive your sins. And also, ever obeys Allah and His Messenger has indeed achieved a great achievement. To proceed, the best of talks is the Book of Allah, the best of guidance, the guidance. His Messenger Muhammad, my peace and blessings be upon him. And the most evil of all matters are the ones innovated for every newly innovated matter in Islam is innovated. Innovation and every innovation is a misguidance, and every misguidance. Would lead to the hellfire. Which is saying it quickly because it's just documented there, and you must have heard it so many times at the beginning of each khutbah of the Jum'ah. Now we're coming to the recommendation to congratulate the couple. Tabar. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that when the Messenger of Allah <laughs> wanted to express marital harmony to the one who got married, he would say, Barakallahu lakuma wa baraka alaykuma wa jama'a baynakuma fi khair. Allah's blessing for you and blessings upon you. May you be joined together in goodness. Right. So, alhamdulillah, uh, we know that how to congratulate those people. Do not say the congratulations that we heard it from the people who are of ignorance. They say to hope children, all of that. No. Barakallahu lakuma wa alaykuma wa jama'a baynakuma fi Now we're coming to the sadaq, which is the the dowry. The dawah, yeah? Yeah. Allah Meaning? And give to the women who you marry their dowry with a good heart, but if they of their own good gesture remit any part of it to you, take it and enjoy it without fear of any harm, as Allah has made it lawful for you. Surah Nisa, verse 4. Right. So the this mehri or this sadaq, which is the Sodaq, which is the dawah, is the right of a woman upon her husband. So it is her money, it's her wealth, and it's not allowed for any person, whether it's a father or anybody else, or the husband himself, to take it without her consent. And the Islam did not come here to define what is the dawah, is left. For whom to decide? It's not for the the bride, nor for the family of the bride, it's actually for the groom himself to decide what is the dawah. So it will be according to his financial capability. But remember that if we are in a land where the dawah is to be too much extreme, too much, or in a land where the dawah is too little, it's not supposed to be the case, it's supposed to be, as I said, according to what the husband is able to give as a dawah. So Normally, it is the case that the Prophet them, he would give the hands of his daughter on a particular da'a, which is uh, within the capability of those who are asking for their hands. So, if we see here, Anas radiallahu anhu arda, he narrates for us, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, may Allah be pleased with him, when the Prophet of Allah made between Muhajirin and Ansar, the immigrants and the inhabitants of Medina, brotherhood to ease the economic crisis. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he had a brother called Sa'd ibn Rabi'a. This person, he was very rich. So when he made the brotherhood, the brotherhood is that this person would inherit his brother even though he's not his blood brother. So if he's got no sons, he would inherit him. So Sa'd ibn Rabi'a, he said, verily my brother Abdul Rahman, I'm one of the most richest people in the Ansar. I would like to divide my wealth between me and you. And I've got two wives. Look at which you like, and I will divorce her for you, so you could marry her. So Abdul Rahman Naaf, he said, may Allah give you barakah in your money, and may Allah make, give you barakah in your family. See, you hear this, the preference over themselves of the Ansar, that is, they gave half the wealth and also one of his wives. But even better response from the Muhajir, he said, Jazakallah, I don't want your money, I don't want the wife. But show me where the market is. Abdul Rahman Naaf, was well known to change the dust into gold. A very good, you know, trader. So he went to the market and he made so much money, enough money, number one, that is to 
feed himself. Number two, to get married. So when he came back, the Prophet of Allah saw upon him the trace of that perfume, which is like a nice perfume, is dressed up properly. Mm, he said to him, what is happening? He said, Messenger of Allah, I got married a woman from the Ansar. He said, how much did you give as a dowry? So who is the one to be asked? It's the husband. How much did you give as a dowry? It's a mehri. So he said, the weight of a date stone in gold. Now the date stone is really not much. Oh, about five grams or two grams, I don't know, weight in gold. So the Prophet of Allah said, okay, make walima even with a li as little as a sheep. Make a walima. All to make a walima. It's a must. So the Prophet وسلم, here, he asked the dawah from the, well, how much did you give her? He didn't say, how much they asked you as a dawah. That means the family of the woman. You didn't ask him that. He said to him, how much did you offer as a dawah? As a mehri. Also, we have another hadith, which is Sahil ibn Sa'ad. He said, verily, I was with the Prophet وسلم, when a woman, she came and she offered herself, she said, Messenger of Allah, I want to offer myself to be as your wife. And this is only for the Prophet of Allah. No woman is supposed to, to come to a sheikh or say, I offer myself to you. It's only for the Prophet of Allah. This is from the specialty of the Prophet Wasallam. So the Prophet Wasallam, he just looked at her and he didn't say anything. It looks like he doesn't want to go ahead and marry this woman. A man who is sad, he said, um, so uh, a man, he said, just went up and he said, verily, messenger of Allah, if you don't want her, I will marry her. This woman, she offered herself three times to the Prophet, and the Prophet of Allah did not go ahead with marrying him. So this man, he said, Messenger of Allah, okay, I want to marry her. So the Prophet of Allah, straight away, he asked him, he didn't ask her how much dawah that you want for this marriage. He asked him, do you have anything to give as a dawah? He said, nothing. He said, well, go and look even for a ring which is made of metal. And by the way, ring of metal is not allowed to be put on. But he is just as little as, which is, you know, like a metal uh, ring, which is not gold. It's worth nothing. Just go and get something similar to it. But you have to, you cannot put a metal ring. You can put as a man as a silver ring. But you cannot put uh, just a metal where that's not silver. It had to be silver. So he said, uh, I he said, I can't find even that metal ring messenger. He was so poor. He said, okay. Do you know some of the Quran? He said, yes, I've got such and such surah and such and such surah. That means I know. I've recited. I have mastered those surahs. So he said, okay, go ahead. I've given you the hand of that woman on the Quran that you've got. That means you teach her those surahs that you know. So this is the mahr and the dawari of yours is to make sure that you uh, uh, teach that woman and you're going to get married to her those surah that you have mastered. So here... The Prophet of Allah did not say to him from the beginning, how much Qur'an do you have? He had asked her for money and property. So it's not correct if somebody thinks that I've got the most pious marriage that I have made my daughter to marry to such and such person with only Qur'an. That's not correct. I mean, it's just not, you have deprived her from her right to have money, have gold as a dowry. So he did not, the Prophet of Allah said to him, okay, how much Qur'an do you have? He had actually graduated with him, bit by bit. Do you have anything to offer? He said, Messenger of nothing. Just go and get a, you know, a ring made of metal. I can't have anything, Messenger. I don't have anything. Then the Prophet of Allah went for this. So it's not correct to say that you are more blessed if you made your daughter to get married to somebody with only Quran while this person is able to give and offer money or offer gold. Remember, this is her right. This is her money. She might need it later on if you divorce her. She might need it on. She wants to, 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 to use it while you are married to her for her own, her own stuff. That's her own money. So the dawa, it has to be a property or a money. It could be as well an addition. Okay, I don't want money. I want hajj. If you make me to go hajj, then I will accept. No problem. So it is up to the uh, uh, the, the women. When the Prophet wasallam. He had said, The one who gives a less dowry or a dowry which is within the capability of the husband, then the barakah will get, will be there. The blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal will be there at the marriage. So it's not correct that the dowry is to be set for boasting. You know, my, my dowry is a hundred thousand. You know, and once I made a marriage, subhanAllah, I can't really forget that marriage. I made it about... I would say maybe 15 plus, about 20 years ago, when I was in, in uh, High Wycombe as an imam. 
And I've never written this number in my life. So what is the dawa? So the dawa is 25,000. I said, what? Is that rupees or what? He said, no, 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 25,000 pounds. Are you sure you're going to be paying this money? 25,000 pounds. Okay. Are you sure? I'm offering that. Okay. So I'm talking now to the bride on the other side. By the way, I want you to have your consent, and you better give your consent because he's giving you 25,000 grand. You better give your consent if you want to go ahead with this marriage. There's 25,000. Is that accepted? Okay. The witness had heard accepted. Okay. I've written the marriage 25,000 pounds. Then I thought this guy, you know, outside is going to have a Rolls Royce parking, you know, or a William Bosch car, anything kind, 25,000 a lot. Anyway, so later on, I knew that my friend gave them a lift. They don't have even a taxi. <laughs> so, so what is going on? He said to me, this is like something, a ritual, and I'm not going to say the country what it is, but this is a ritual. The people, they put high numbers, even though that the husband will never give anything to the wife, which is not correct, yeah, wife. That's a promise. 25,000, if you die, then this 25,000 has to go from your inheritance, from your money that you left before any money goes to your children. So this mahar mehri could be given one go. It could be given later on. It could be given in parts. It could be given first part and then later on second part. But it's not without a dowry. Without a dowry, it's not correct. It has to be with a dowry. From the condition of the marriage, that there is a dowry. Yes, maybe you could, don't pay it now, you could pay it later on. If you did not set a dowry because you were ignorant, then this woman, she deserved the dowry of her similar type. What does it mean similar type? If she's learning, how much learned women to be paid the dowry as? If she's, for example, not learning, how much dowry this woman would be offered? If she's such and such age, how much dowry usually will be offered? So she would be given, given as an Arabic, mahrul mithl. The mahar of the woman who's similar in her rank, similar in her education, similar in her age. And if the man has died without offering that, that dowry, then this dowry will go ahead, taken from the estate that has been left by the husband. Now, if the husband the died and the contract was made and there was no uh, a consummation, means intercourse, so this woman, she made the contract. And yet to consume, there's no intercourse. And the husband died, then the woman is entitled for the full mahr. For the full mahr. Um, there's a hadith here I would like you to read and write it. al -Qamah. He said, Uti Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Masur is given. Yes? al -Qamah said, Abdullah ibn Masur, who was brought the issue of a woman who was married to a man, and then he died before the consummation of the marriage and before agreeing upon a dower. Abdullah anhu said, In my view, she should receive the dower of women who are similar to her. She inherits from him and she enters the Ida period. Ma'fir ibn Sinan Ashja'i, he said, then bore witness that the Messenger of Allah Allah gave the same decision as Abdullah. But the one who did in a similar case of Birwa bin called Barwa bin Tuwashik, the daughter of Washak. He gave a similar verdict. So this woman, whom her husband had died, and before consummation, but after the contract, he said she will inherit, she's still his wife. And also she's got to have this tower, the mahr of hers as well, and she has to as well do the idda. And the idda of a woman who did not have the consummation. Uh, is four months and ten days. A woman whom her husband died is always four months and ten days, except for those who are pregnant. If she's pregnant, then her idda once she up to once she delivers the baby. Once she delivers the baby, her idda, her period will be finished. And we've discussed that before. So now we know, alhamdulillah, that the woman she's entitled for her dowry, full dowry, uh, even before consummation if her husband died. Fine. Now, if, for example, the husband had divorced, now this is going to do the divorce section. We'll talk about that, but I'm going to give you a full taste. If the husband had divorced his wife before intercourse, before intercourse, the ayah says, falaha nisf, she will be having half of the dowry. So if he made the contract, 
and he had to intercourse to consume the marriage. And he divorced her within that period. She will have what? Half. If he had consumed the marriage and she is, and he divorced her, then she's entitled to that full dowry. Okay? She had consumed the marriage. If he had, sorry, consummated the marriage and she he had made intercourse and he divorces her, then she's entitled for the full down. Right. It is, says here, when is better to go and make your marriage? Which month? Prophet of Allah made the marriage in Shawwal and Aisha radiallahu anha. But it doesn't mean that the Shawwal is the best of month of marriage. But it is not maybe advised, I should say, to get married within Ramadan. Because if you are married within Ramadan, you're going to be chained like this until the night. And you might not hold yourself during the day. And you might go into trouble because you're fasting. So it's better to not to marry in Ramadan. Marry outside Ramadan. So you could be, you know, for the intercourse. Because when the couple are married, they are into, you could say, in the mood that is to be together all the time. So that is why I would say in Ramadan, it's not advised, but no problem. For verily, the brother of Aisha, he was married to his wife in Ramadan. He was married to her in Ramadan. Right. What is supposed to be uh, favored here and, and recommended to be done when the person comes to his wife the first time? Now, so you've got the contract. You know, the first time you're going to be meeting her now. And this is going to be before the consummation of the marriage, before the intercourse, what you should do. Please read. Because I'm not going to be making words. I'm not sure about them. It's recommended for the husband to be very kind to her. Thus, he should present a drink or something of that nature to her. It doesn't mean it has to be a drink. It could be, it could be food as well. Anything. You know, just, it's just to break the ice. You see, he's talking here about a woman who had seen the husband for the first time. Or she hasn't been having sort of interaction for a long time. But these days, before they get married, they have already talking to each other a lot. They got used to each other so much. Do you understand me? So it is, uh, you know, it's not, uh, I met you yesterday, didn't I? I was talking to you. Okay. So that's why we say, Kwani, this will help the marriage. It's not really to have too much interact before the marriage. During the period of khutbah or khutbah, which is engagement, He's not supposed to take to talk to the wife to be unless there's a need. So there's a need. Like, for example, I'm not sure. I want to ask about this. But to keep talking to her all the time, you think you're going to be knowing everything about her. She's going to know everything about you. It's impossible. Until you live with another. So too much exaggeration to meet one another before the marriage is not allowed. And of course, it's haram if it is a, on their own. It has to be with somebody else. They're in prison. So, I mean, some people they want to marry, see once, twice, okay, three times. But let's say before the marriage, there were about 20 days, 20 times. Every day he's going to see her. What is this? I want to know what type of food she likes, to know what she, type of she, she doesn't like. I That's impossible to know, Ikhwani, unless you live with the person. So it's not correct to exaggerate. It has to be that yeah, I need to see um, something in her eye to make sure that I'm correct. So looking at her and making your decision, and then when you enter upon her, it would be much more of a motivation that you have seen this person very little rather than this is like you've seen her yesterday. You got bored of her, you could see her every day. But this time it's like it's the first time you'll have more appetite to make the you know the intercourse. <laughs> I've hopefully found the right words. <laughs> Asma bin Zayd radiallahu anha said Asma bin Tuzayd no. I beautified Aisha radiallahu anha for the message of Remember she was nine years old no. Sallallahu Then I came to him and called him to come and be with her He came and sat next to her He brought a large cup of milk He drank some and then gave it to her She lowered her head and was shy You see she's shy She was shy, lowered her head The shyness is the beauty of the woman these days, you don't find the shyness. She would look at him like this. <laughs> she wants to grill him. <laughs> well, I've seen a sister. She is asking me, I want to see him. Can I grill him, please? <laughs> She's going to grill him with the question. So, I mean, it's become the man is shy and the woman is not shy. 
So she's shy. That's just shy's beauty. Now, nah, Baba. Asma radiallahu anha then said, I encouraged her and said, take it from the hand of the Prophet. Uh, here, she's not in Fantahartuha. No, I told her off. Come on, take it from the Prophet. It's not encouraged. Agree, they told her off. Come on, take it from the hand of the Prophet. And then she, she then took it and drank some of it. He also, at that time, Prophet Sallallahu broke food. He was broke food. So, Prophet of Allah, he offered the ladies who were there, who were ladies there. He offered the ladies, the wives of his, okay, to go and have. They said, Messenger of Allah, la nashtahi, meaning we don't have any appetite. He said, la tajma'na ju'an wa kadiba. Don't combine between the two things, which is you're hungry and you're liars. You're hungry and you're liars because you're not really truthful when you said you don't have any appetite. You just were shy. Because you see, I would say, Prophet of Allah, he said that if you're hungry, eat. But it's good as well. The person always shows himself that he's not really spongy. Do you know what the word spongy here? It's all the time. You know, whenever there's an occasion where there's food, he will just jump without even invitation. People don't like that person. Always, you know, keep yourself sort of, uh, we say in Arabic, Iz nafsak, yani. you always make yourself a sort of not all the time in need of what is in the hands of other people. Always. That is, have zuhud. Don't look at the things in the hands of the people all the time. I want to have this. I want to have this. People will not like you. They will keep avoiding you. They will love. But if you keep away from it, you will. people will love you. I'll give you an example. So a person who's all the time, when he walks with you, he doesn't buy anything to have food. Every time you buy food, he comes and shares you without you asking him. Maybe the first time, Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah, the second time, third time, you say, what is this person? He doesn't buy food. And every time I buy food, he just puts his fork and dig it into my chips or fish and chips. True or not, he doesn't like it. <laughs> Yeah, you say, but you don't like it because why? he's a spongy. He's just living on other people's, you know, he's like a spongy, like a, you know, that, that worm that loves him to the, lives him to the sucking or the blood of the others. It's not correct. So once, twice, but always. The, if somebody asks you, please eat, and you say to him, when he insists and you go ahead, he would love you because you are a person who's not really willing to go ahead and take advantage of him. Right. Uh, now, the other issue. So, number one, is to be kind and to be good in your words. Make it easy. Then after that, he will shoot, put his hands. Put his hand on her forehead. That's the forehead. You mention the name of Allah and pray for blessings. So, Bismillah, and then oh Allah. He should ask the statement that is in accord with his Allahumma, you know, So the speech is, Allahumma in yas'aluka min khayriha wa barakatiha wa khayri ma jabaltaha alayhi wa a'udhu bika min sharriha wa sharri ma jabalta alayhi. Oh Lord, I ask you from her good and the good of what you have created her from. And I seek refuge in you from her evil and the evil that you created her from. So this is something that is to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make sure that the bond will be upon the barakah of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you say Bismillah and call for barakah. Now also it is recommended for you to pray to Raqqa. So you pray the to Raqqa. She's not next to you. She's behind you. And this has been uh, narrated by our Sahaba radiallahu anha, the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have the first one, Abu Sa'id, Mawla Abi Usayn. This is a person who is a slave and he was emancipated later on, means freed. So he said, I have, I'm okay. Yeah, I have to, I have to. Abu Sa'id, the ex-slave of Abu Sa Usayn said, I married while I was a slave. I invited a number of Look the Sahaba, yeah. including Ibn Masood. Ibn Masood. So they are Abudar high companions. Abdullah Ibn Masood, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Hudayfa, Ibn Yaman. These are highly scholars of the companions, just any companions. The call of the commencement of the prayer, the Adhan was given. Abu Dhar stepped forward to lead the prayer. They said, no. He said, was it like this? They said, yes. So I led them in the prayer whilst... I was an own slave. So yeah. what 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 is the what is he, what does he mean by that? Can anybody explain to me what is happening here? What is happening here? That they went to this slave when he got married to congratulate him. And when the salah was established, they want to make the now the iqama and want to, to lead. Abu Dahar wanted to lead. So the other companions, Abu Abdullah Masud and they said, No, stop. Oh, we did like this. He said, Yes. 
So he himself, Abu Sa'id, the slave, he led them in the prayer. What do you understand from that? Yet he was a slave. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن الرجل في سلطانه Person should never be led while he is having the sovereignty. That means he's the owner of the house. إلا بإذن Except with his permission. So you come, I come to somebody's house. And this person, let's say, is not half of as much as me, for example. I am not entitled to lead unless he gives me permission to lead. Whether I'm half of more than him or not, it doesn't regard it because it's his house. This half of comes to my house. I have the, what, the priority to lead. And he's not allowed to lead, even his half of that I'm not half of, unless I give him permission to what? To lead. This is a slave. And he's not half of, he's not even as knowledgeable as his companions, Abu Dharr or Abu Lama. So he wanted to go and lead. He said, back off, can't lead. Oh, is it like this? Yes. So the slave led because it's his house. So he led. And then now they started to teach him. Go ahead. They taught me by saying, when your wife comes to you, pray to Rafaz and then ask for the good of what has come to you and seek refuge from this evil. Then it is your affair and your wife's affair. Simple instruction, hey, Khawari. Do you understand me? Simple instructions. Well, then to pray to Raka, then put your hands on the head of the Baraka, and then seek the Baraka and seek refuge in Allah from the evil. And then it's you and your wife. They didn't give him the details of what he and your wife. Because this is natural, the Khawari. It comes natural. <clears throat> so I don't have to go and sit and teach him. Uh, you have to have one step, one step, two step, three. Give him a, a manual. This is comes natural. Comes natural. Okay? Everything comes natural. So you, you, you just behave the way that you behave. Of course there will be shyness. And the shyness is always there. So alhamdulillah, which is very good. Okay. So everything comes there. Like al-sha'nuka wa ahluk. Sha'nuka wa ahluk. Five. Second one, which is shaqiq, he said. Narrated a man named Abu Qarib. Abu Hariz, Dan. Said, I have married a young virgin girl and I'm afraid that she will dislike me. Abdullah, that is Ibn Masood, then said, Bonding is from Allah and such dislike is from Shaitan, who desires to make you dislike something that Allah has made permissible for you. Thus, when she comes to you, tell her to pray two Bahas behind you. In another narration, Abu Masood, who further said, Say, O oh Allah, Bless me by my family, and bless my family by me. Oh Allah, bring us together as what you brought together in goodness, and separate between us if we separate in goodness. Okay. Now when you say, when you intercourse with her, Bismillah, Allahumma jannibna shaytan wa jannib shaytana ma razaqtana. In the name of Allah, O oh Lord, make the shaytan to be away from us, and also to make the shaytan away from what you have provided us. You have given us. So if Allah Azza wa Jal, could you read that hadith, please? Concerning the supplication, the Prophet وسلم, said, and then if Allah decrees that they should have a child, shaitan will never harm him. Okay. So if Allah decreed that from this intercourse there will be a child, shaitan will not harm him. Here doesn't mean he's going to be infallible. No. But he will not be deceived from the shaitan. He will not be from his followers. Saying Bismillah at the time of the intercourse, and if Allah decreed a son or a daughter to be as a result of that intercourse, Allah will respond to your dua and he will be not easy to be a follower of the shaitan, nor he will be as well easy target uh, and a prey for the shaitan to be deceived. But he's not going to be infallible, as we said. Masoom. Now, go ahead, doctor, please, Sheikh. So we can stop here. Go. Just go and say it. Um, he may approach his wife for intercourse from any position he wishes. Allah SWT says. Um, and by the way, this is an important, Ikhwani, and there's not be shyness with this. We don't have to be shy. It's important to know. So, so, so Surah Baqarah, verse 2 to 3. Your wives are a tilt for you, so go to your tilt when or how you will. Right. That means. Mukbila mudbira. So he says here that the person, okay, he should intercourse into the vagina, regardless the direction. Where you come to the vagina from, wherever it is, there is no specification, as long as the intercourse is in the vagina. 
So there is no description. Prophet Allah said, Nisa'ukum hartul lakum. You women is a land to plow. Why are you going to plow? You're going to put, you know, uh, uh, plowing like your son and your children. So this is the land to plow. And I'm, I'm, I'm planting it with my seeds. With the semens. So, Allah speaks about it in general. Because it's based on the good words, not say sexual words. Come to your uh, heart, your plow, your land, you want to plow, the way that you wish. No description for it. And now there's a further description here. I would like to, doctor, to read it. Jabir, he said, The Jews would say that if a man pinched his wife from behind, but through the vagina, the child would be cross-eyed. <laughs> Subhanallah. The, 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 the Jews used to say that if the man comes to the woman from behind, but is still intercoursing with her vagina, that the son will come out with, or a daughter, crossed eyes. What is this? So, I came. No. Also, the ayah came for another reason. Allah says, The district of the Ansar were idol worshippers. Ansar, the of the Jews yeah, the people. Ansar who lived in the Medina. And the outskirts of the Medina, the Jews. Ansar were the idolaters. They had no knowledge. Nothing. But they used to take their etiquettes of wife and husband from the Jews, who are the people of the book. Remember, the Jews are the people of the book. They still got some words of Allah. Father. The Ansar used to consider them as having superior knowledge as in the Jews. Therefore, they would imitate them in many of their acts. It was a practice of the people of the book that they would not approach their wives except from the side. Except from the side, that means on, on the side, not one on top of the other, on the side, man and a woman. Now. In this way, the woman is most concerned. Thus, those Ansar took this practice from them. The Quraysh, on the other hand, would put the women on their backs and approach their wives in any fashion, from in front, behind, or on the backs. Meaning that those people who came from Mecca, they were idolaters. They were not having Jews around them to teach them anything. So they used to enjoy themselves the way they like. They don't care. They don't care how they approach their wives. Now. And then this incident, when Muhajirun came to Medina, one of them married a woman of the Ansar. So now we have an incident, and when they came to Medina, they're going to have a marriage now. Abdul Rahman Awf is marrying a woman from the Ansar. Another companion from the Ansar, Muhajirun, marrying from the Ansar. What happened? They began to approach her in one of the other fashions, and she objected to this. She because said, she's been taught, or maybe she was married before, by her family, that it's supposed to be approached from the sides. So this person is taking advantage, is not doing what she had learned. So she, she didn't really accept. Go on. She said, we only have intercourse on the side. Do that or stay away from me. Do that or stay away from me. I don't want you. So? This reached the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah then revealed the ayah. Nisa'ukum hartu lakum fa'tu hartakum an nashitu. That means you could do whatever you like as long as you are in the right uh, place. Now. Go on. And it's not haram. Haram. Could continue, please. Sodomy? Yeah. yeah. Sodomy is, however, prohibited. Sodomy means is a person into causing in the, not the whole, to the front, in the back. That is haram, it's called sodomy. Now. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever has intercourse with a menstruating woman or commits sodomy with a woman has committed disbelief in what has been revealed in the message of Allah. Even a disbelief in them. So that means it's, it's a major sin that the person does that. Right. By this, shall we finish here? I will give you another two minutes for questions. Okay? Uh, there's one question from the last week, which I promised that I would uh, read out. Sheikh, we were talking about the, the Ibn period and the offer of marriage last time. So the sister asked, what does it mean to beautify yourself after the Ibn for offer in marriage? Is this the women looking for their male relatives? Yeah, so me, meaning when the when the woman her idda is finished, remember we talked about Sabi'a or Subaya, radiallahu anha, whom her husband died and she had given birth straight away, maybe the same night or the night, three nights after that. Remember that hadith? Subaya, where is Zubayr? Yes, her husband died and she was pregnant and she delivered the baby three, four nights. After that, she straight away beautified herself so that the other people come and marry him. So Ibn Ba'kak, Abu Sanabil is Kunya, 
he said to her, oh, I could see that you're beautifying yourself because she was she was to go and as well uh, work uh, to go and collect the woods and all of this. So he saw her. So I said, you are actually now already have finished your idda, now you're out. He said, you have to really make idda until the, the longer of the two idda because four months, 10 days or until she delivers a baby. So she went to the Prophet of Allah. The Prophet of Allah said, Kadaba, He's wrong. It's not correct. It is until she delivers a baby. The ones who are pregnant, their time until they deliver the baby. The question is that, is that the woman, she's allowed to put beauty hair for her, for the men to look at her? Okay. You know, first, first of all, this, uh, this uh, the beauty here is not just for the men. No, the beauty for the women, because usually is the case, the woman as well chooses for their sons, chooses for their what is the right spouse. So she would see her, she's beautified, looking nice. Okay, she, she's not necessary to put in the beauty for the man. As for the man, the woman, either she shows her face or she does not show her face. And the only makeup she's allowed to put is her airliner. Her airliner, any, what do you call it, kuhl, eh? airliner. The airliner is that put the kohal in her eyes. And this is for the sake of the woman. If she's come up with this airliner, no problem, inshallah. So this woman dressed up nicely in a, in a way that people will be looking at her. But if she dressed up in a bad way, people will not look at her. That's what it means. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to put the makeup, which is a full makeup, and then show myself to a man. That's not correct. But as I said, it's for the woman. Is that the question, Matt? Rose, I think conscious of time, Sheikh has another class. So, inshallah, we'll, if you remember your question, we'll take I will, I'll take one question from the brothers. Sure. If you have any questions from the brothers here? No question. Khalas, alhamdulillah, they have released me. Jazakumullah. Wa subhanakallah. Barakallah.